All right. All right. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for our second session of Lunch with Randy this fall. Um, today, we have Clean Scales attorney and partner Jenny Walters. She's going to be giving you a taste of what we have in store for you at our upcoming geriatric symposium on October 22nd. So I'm actually going to go ahead and talk about that symposium very briefly before we begin. I do have the schedule pulled up here that you'll see on your screen, and I'm sure you can tell, but we have an amazing lineup of really great speakers from our staff here at Clean Scales, and also outside speakers that we were very lucky enough to get. So this is going to be an all-day event on Friday, October 22nd, and your registration includes all of the great content from those seven sessions, CEU credits, breakfast, snacks, and catered lunch from the Rose Garden. So originally, Randy wanted to make this event cost around $200 because of all of the exclusive content and bonuses that you'll receive. And then some of our staff wanted to charge a fee if you registered after October 1st. But I argued that we wanted to be sure we gave everyone the opportunity to make it. So just so you know, we're giving you all of this for just $110. So if you'd like to register today, please go ahead and visit our website. And I'll put that in the chat box. Um, and register online and I'll go ahead and send you the forms that you need or you can go ahead and email me at my email address and I'll put that in the chat box as well and then we can reach out to you that way. Um, so this is for our symposium we'd really love to have you um, it's going to be a really great time we're going to get lots of great information from all of our speakers um, and so please reach out to us if you're interested in that and so without any further ado I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Jenny um, to get us started to talk about Medicaid since she is one of our Medicaid experts in the office. Please do feel free um, to type any questions that you have in the chat box at the bottom of your screen and then we'll go ahead and we'll ask Jenny those questions um, so she can address them as they come up. So thank you Jenny we're ready to get started. All right. Um, we got a pretty good group on. I'm just curious I'm going to talk about Medicaid. I never know out of the group who deals with Medicaid, if people deal with applications, if people are totally new. So if, if, if you're able and if you want, um, just put in the chat box if you apply for Medicaid, if you don't deal with Medicaid at all, um, I'm just kind of wanting to get a sample of who we've got on and, and what they may know. Um, like Emily said, Joy and I are gonna be speaking at the symposium. Right now our Medicaid team is mainly me, um, Joy Thomas, who some of you may have worked with, and also Jill Jones, who some of you may have worked with. Um, and so I'm going to talk about just some things that are going on in the office right now, some updates. Um, but at the symposium, we'll get in, be getting into some of this in more detail. And so right now, the big one is COVID. And some of you may know, but there is actually a policy right now where um, they're really not kicking anybody off Medicaid. Um, if you're over resources, if you've gifted money away, there was a policy memo that came out. Um, I'm looking, I think is around April um, or June, uh, right around there, there were two things that come out. The first one is that really, unless you ask to be taken off Medicaid, there's not a lot you can do to screw it up to get yourself kicked off. Now there may be consequences later down the road if um, you've made some gifts or done something um, that may catch up with you if you're on Medicaid. But for right now, nobody's getting kicked off. Um, the other thing that came up was um, they gave people additional time to appeal. So now on top of the normal, I think about 33 days you got to appeal, you get 120 days to appeal. That's kind of meant that previously, before that policy, we could use appeals as a way to kind of get CanCare going on some things. If they hadn't processed the application in 45 days, which never had happened, we could file an appeal just to kind of get them moving with the intent of, you know, getting everything sorted out before the actual hearing came, um, the hearing date came up because really nobody wants to go to a hearing. But now that there's that much more time to request an appeal, um, we just really haven't been using that strategy very much. Jenny, can I interrupt you really quick? Uh huh. We do have quite a few people who are commenting about um, how they deal with Medicaid, um, saying I can't their memory. See them. 
um the chats are just coming to me I think maybe oh, um, okay yeah so sorry. I was like nobody's answering <laughs> Yeah, we have quite a few people saying they're a memory care community and they accept HCBS. Okay. Um, they apply for Medicaid for their residents, MCO, applied for and are receiving. Um, I am part of a PE team in our facility with Medicaid. I assist patients with applying for Medicaid. And then we also okay. do have a question here. I'm okay. talking about a policy where if no one is getting kicked off that you, that you mentioned earlier, so how, what are you doing if someone is on Medicaid and is over resources? Okay, so, and we have a few people like that. Um, what we're telling them right now is to just kind of sit tight um, because they're not gonna get kicked off. We do, like for example, we've had someone sell their home. Um, we do report that kind of as a CYA because we would normally have to report that. We go ahead and submit that information, but we know that we're not gonna get a um, notice back saying that person has been kicked off. I was actually on a call this morning um, with some other attorneys getting ready for another presentation we're going to be doing and um, this attorney's in Salina and she was saying that she had a such kind of a complicated situation she was worried about being over resources she was worrying about you know one spouse passes away that means the surviving spouse that is in long-term care on Medicaid is entitled to inherit a portion of the resources so she knew that issue was coming up and they got on the phone with the caseworker and the caseworker were just not that worried about any of it and so they're just gonna sit tight on everything. So again, that's what we're doing, but we still report it. And we're just kind of waiting to hear some sort of something about a notice that um, that policy is gonna end, hoping we get kind of a notice ahead of time, like, hey, in 30 days, this COVID emergency is ending and things are gonna go back to normal. Um, this has also meant that we're not having to do renewals um, they're not even sending out the renewal information. It's a little bit of a uh, like looming thing in our office. You know, when are those going to start? Because we're a little worried they're just all going to hit at once. Um, the only thing we've heard is that um, I think a caseworker told either Jill or Joy that they right now they have renewals scheduled for February, but that doesn't mean they're not just going to get pushed out another month. So at the soonest, we think it'd be February. Um, but that's all we know. Um, okay, so thanks for responding and thanks Emily for letting me know. Um, a couple other things that have been um, relatively recent. Um, is there's some, um, there's a policy that if you have paid the nursing home ahead of time and try to apply for Medicaid, that payment to the nursing home could be viewed as accountable resource. And so this really, in reality, you know, this, I understand facilities need paid, but then on the other side, we have to be careful that if somebody has paid ahead of time, you know, or even for that month, that that payment's not going to turn around and be viewed as accountable resource. And then Medicaid's going to say, well, you're actually over resources because you've paid the nursing home. So that's something we're just trying to be really careful about to make sure we get somebody qualified and also not have that payment viewed as a, as a resource. Um, I also wanted to mention um, there was a new policy that came out clarifying um, divorces and adding some additional requirements. Can care is really, we don't have this come up very often. Um, people do not want to, you've been married 50 years, you don't want to get divorced just because somebody's been in long-term care. But we have had at least two situations where a family was a later second marriage, um, you know, people had their own children, and they did decide that divorce was going to be the best route for them. One family had some farm ground. It, I mean, it, it kind of made sense. We we're just going to do have them do kind of a paper divorce. Um, but we have to be careful because CanCare has a, some rules right now for divorces that basically you have to have your own representation. Like each person has to be represented separately. Um, and because if not, they view it as not fair. Um, and they could come back and say, well, actually the spouse in the nursing home was entitled to more than they got. Um, this was a, you know, kind of a sham. And so that's something we've just really had to watch in the divorce situation that even if you're gonna get a divorce and have a judge sign off on it, 
you still gotta have some requirements so can care doesn't come back and say, no, actually we don't agree with that. You should have more resources than you ended up with. Um, some other things, um, just little things lately. Um, we've had some issues with can care and our authorizations. Every once in a while, we'll get a caseworker that says, nope, we don't wanna to talk to you because you don't have the right authorization on file. And then we have to work through some higher up at can care to figure out, okay, what's wrong now? Why won't you talk to us and get that authorization issue fixed? Um, the reviews being extended had been, has been nice for families and for us. Um, we had some issues come up with farm accounts. Um, if you have someone with farm ground, you, we recommend they have a separate farm account for their income and expenses to run through. But if you don't use that account over the year, let's say the family screws it up and puts the farm income in the personal account or just doesn't have any farm expenses, um, then they could start counting it if it's not actually active. They're also very picky about having farm on the statement. And so we have to make sure families get that on there. For a while, it just seemed like um, we'd have a pretty specific question that we needed an answer to. And the response we got from um, the caseworkers or even some higher up was, well, just go look at this KESIM. It was like they didn't want to give us an answer to a specific question. They didn't want to put themselves on the line. They just referred us back to the KESIM and then we just have to try it and see if we got a denial or something. So that was frustrating. Um, at some point, um, Jill and Joy at our office felt like they were having better access to caseworkers than they had been for a while. Um, we have in the last year or so um, been confident that a community spouse's IRA um, was exempt regardless of whether it was work related or how it was originated. If there's a community spouse and they have an, uh, an account that's an IRA, we know it's not gonna count against them. We've been using the grievance process a little more rather than the formal appeals um, and generally think that we've gotten some faster responses on Medicaid applications than we had been for a while. Sometimes we'll get notices that just don't make sense. They'll be out of order. Um, and so we kind of have to wait for everything to come in. It just seems like I, th I think for about every case, we've got to call CanCare to have things clarified for us. Um, we've been taking advantage of a rule that says, um, you, even if you've done the division of assets and have a spin down complete, you don't actually have to have accounts literally separated until 90 days after Medicaid qualification or the notice comes out. So that's really given our families more time to like even just get a separate checking account open for the Medicaid recipient because get it's getting social security moved or getting new accounts open can be a little overwhelming when you're kind of right in the thick of just getting the spin down done. Um, and so that's kind of gives, given them some breathing room to get accounts separated or get ownerships changed. Um, even 90 days out from the approval. Another one is that we've been using, let me go back. So when you do a division of assets um, and you have the community spouse and let's say they have $20,000 to spend down um, that we could preserve for them, um, we can convert that into income. And a lot of times we would use an annuity, a special Medicaid annuity to do that. But recently we've been doing promissory notes a lot where that community spouse could loan that $20,000 to a kid. They get, get paid back over a period of months. It's a really quick way to complete the spin down and still preserve money for that community spouse um, so it doesn't have to be spent down. Allows that community spouse to keep some more money to stay at home. And here's kind of a big one. And the last one is that, and this came up this morning in the call with the other attorneys, um, was that we just have not heard from estate recovery lately. If, if you would have asked me like two or three years ago, you know, I would have said that if you had farm ground or a house and you were on Medicaid and passed away, you were probably going to hear from estate recovery. They were going to open up a creditor's probate within six months of death and you were going to have to deal with them. And right now, we aren't hearing anything. 
the attorney in Salina that has people with farm ground said she hasn't heard anything. It's it, we know one of the attorneys has left, but it, it's it's been a good thing for families, but it's just kind of odd that it's been so quiet. And Emily sent me a note. We've heard rumors that the HCBS waiver income limit was going to change. Do you have any information on that? Yes, that's kind of the um, that's a big one. And I actually I'd actually asked Jill about that. Um, and I think it's about going to go up to about $2,300. Right now, I think it's more like $1,100. I'd have to find my sheet. Um, CanCare has told, I think both Jill and Joy, that that policy has changed. I think Jill said someone told her that it has actually changed as of July 1st, but we have not seen, I think maybe there's some issues for the website. We have not seen it come out on the website. We haven't seen a policy memo come out. There's a website we can check that has all the new policy memos and key some changes. Um, so we're assuming it's true. We haven't seen it, but that's going to make a big difference for 2384. Yep, there you go. I bet that's it. Um, that's going to make a huge difference for assisted living. It seems like we're doing more HCBS now for people with assisted living, and it gets to be a little tight um, with the protected income amount and being able to still pay room and board when HCBS only covers services. But if these people can keep that much more money, I, it's probably going to open the door to assisted living to a lot more people and hopefully just make assisted living you know, and Medicaid work together better or even HCBS at home. Let me see what else is on my list. Um, oh, another, while we're on the HCBS subject, um, was on a Zoom with just kind of a monthly meeting with the other attorneys that are in the um, Kansas NALA, which is the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys Group. Um, and we learned about that with HCBS, if you have a married couple, what we had been doing was submitting a Medicaid application and resource assessment so we could get that snapshot done. Um, so that if, let's say the people were at home and paying for some care, but we really weren't ready to pull the trigger on Medicaid, but we wanted to lock in our snapshot so that if money was spent, it would count towards that spin down. So again, we'd been submitting a full, grown, full blown resource assessment Medicaid application learned that there's actually a form that we can use to get that assessment done by probably like the Area Agency on Aging. We've done this once and it's worked and CanCare has verified with us that yes, it works. So as long as we get that form that the assessment has been done and there's a box that I think is checked that says it's for HCBS or Medicaid, that establishes our snapshot. Then we don't have to go through all the work and put the families through all the work of coming up with all that documentation for the actual resource assessment. We get a simple form done and our snapshot is done. So that was a really big one and really helpful one that's come up. If anybody else has got anything else, feel free to chime in. I'm just looking through my list here. Um, Randy and I were talking before this about some things that have come up. Um, another recent one is dealing with farms. Um, We've had one where somebody later in life, you know, let's they're probably in their 80s, decides they want to sell their farm. Okay, fine. But as usual, then when you're dealing with long term care and Medicaid, Medicaid tends to screw things up or things that you've done that seem perfectly legal and should be fine, screw up Medicaid. So if, if someone's older and decides to sell their farm, it has to be done. Um, the payments have to be made. They have to be actuarially sound, I mean that, meaning that person has to get paid back for that farm within their life expectancy based on CanCare's table, which is roughly the same as the Social Security life expectancy table. So we actually had to work with CanCare, get their permission, restructure those farm payments so that it was actuarially sound and the people could stay on Medicaid. Um, another thing that comes up with farms is that a lot of people have, you know, farm debts or you know they have a mortgage they're paying on, but um, the Medicaid rules actually say that you can't, if you're a Medicaid recipient, you're not going to be allocated any money to pay on that debt. You're only going to be able to pay on the interest. And so that's a big problem with debt that we have to figure out and try to get that paid off because these people just aren't going to have any money to be able to pay on their loan. 
It gets a little trickier than that. Sometimes if it's like an operating loan, we can get away with it. Um, but generally that farm stuff gets a little more complicated, but those are some of the things that come up. Um, back on the HCBS topic, um, the protected income amount is gonna be really great um, because with HCBS, the planning opportunities and the techniques that we have with more just traditional Medicaid in the nursing home are limited when it comes to HCBS. So if someone has given money away and, and are in the nursing home and have some money left, we know that we can use like that promissory note thing or an annuity to convert the assets into income and be able to pay for care during that penalty. So that way the facility isn't on the hook or you know doesn't have a, a bill adding up because the person's got a Medicaid penalty. We take that money that's left over turn it into income, we pay through the penalty. But with HCBS, it just really doesn't work. Um, it's hard to figure out when we do those strategies, we have to know what the Medicaid rate is so we don't set the income too high so the penalty doesn't start and the whole thing doesn't work. But with, but with like assisted living or at home with HCBS, it's really hard to crunch those numbers. And so there's not an easy fix um, for gifting and, you know, we're not able to do that, those other planning techniques if we're dealing with HCBS. Randy thought that he had heard there was more money coming for HCBS. We didn't have any more details, but hopefully that's true. Um, the other things I have written down are that um, when we're recently, we've had some issues with uh, funeral plans and assigning life insurance to funerals. Um, I think the Kisa makes it sound like, you know, as long as it's irrevocable, it's fine, but we've run into some issues with CanCare wanting some specific language on the forms, but then the insurance companies give us some pushback about getting that language on their forms. And so sometimes we have to cash the policies out um, to get it done. Another one um, to kind of switch gears, I know this week, the topic was Medicaid, um, but relatively recently, there's been some VA updates. They're kind of important to, to be aware of. Um, prior to 2018, we could actually gift money away um, and qualify somebody for VA because there was no look back period for VA. So, and VA isn't so helpful in like long-term care, because it's so expensive, the VA income someone is going to get isn't enough to pay for care. So we usually have to look at Medicaid. But it became really helpful like in assisted living or getting home care because that extra income could be enough to mean that that person could stay in assisted living or keep the care in their home and not have to go to long-term care because they were out of money. But now um, there is a look back period for VA. It started in 2018 so that um, the calculation is different than Medicaid, but the big picture is that you can't give, just give assets away to qualify for VA. Another update that came up was that now VA has a hard asset limit that whatever, 130,000, it, it's basically the same as Medicaid now, which makes it a lot simpler for us because we, be, prior to that, it was kind of a gray area when someone would qualify and when they wouldn't, but now it just makes more sense because they have a hard asset limit and we know exactly how many assets somebody has and how, what they have to be below to qualify for VA pension. Um, that's about all the main ones I had. Any, Emily, are you seeing anything else? Or, I mean, even if anybody's got a Medicaid question unrelated to anything I've talked about, um, you know, feel free to bring it up. We can talk through it. Um, interested to see what other people have had going on or issues they may have had come up. Yeah, I don't see any more in the chat box right now, but um, like Jenny mentioned, um, even if you'd want to maybe unmute yourself and ask a question, yeah. I'm sure that people probably have very similar questions as well. So please feel free to unmute yourself, um, chat in the chat box. Um, if you have any of those questions for Jenny.
And of course, if you don't have any right now, um, we'll send a follow up email that will have, um, you know, our contact information. Um, so if you do have any follow up questions that you think of later, we can always have Jenny um, address those and we can get back to you as well. Um, I do just see one come through, Jenny, if you wouldn't mind um, addressing this one. Um, it's a question. It says, so setting up the promissory note, would that need to be through a lawyer? Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying this just to, as a plug for us, but I would say yes, um, just because there are some requirements. It's not like you can just say, oh, I'm going to loan it to this person and they'll pay me back. I'm spent down. Um, there's some language in the KESM that has to be in there. Um, we want to make sure that the payments coming back are reasonable. We don't want to, I just told somebody this morning, I, I don't want to loan $20,000 and then you pay it back in one month. Um, so, so reality is no, um, you, you know, you could try to do this. No, you don't have to have an attorney to do a Medicaid application, but I would be hesitant to deal with anything with Medicaid without having somebody that really knows the rules look over it because the end result is can care picks out some little language that's not in there and for example it just so happens again this morning we're talking about talking to one of the attorneys in wichita that's going to present with us really like brilliant attorney and he's like we had one and we didn't have um, the language in there that can care wanted about um, that it couldn't be canceled upon death it wasn't in there and we got denied and then we had to go to appeal um and so that's an example of even an attorney you know having to watch for that language but then the end result is you've applied for medicaid it takes them two months to process it then you realize something's not quite right then you're not qualified back to you know when you want it and you've already got this promissory note that's paying out so i hope that kind of answers the question <laughs> about whether that's needed Got anything else, Emily? Yes, thank you for addressing that question. Um, I do not see any other questions popping up in the chat box at this moment. Um, so I would say if you have any last minute questions, please go ahead and get those in. Unmute yourself, we'd love to hear from you. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We always get a lot of questions and a lot of requests to talk about Medicaid because it's just so multifaceted. So um, please reach out to us if you have any questions. Like I said, we'll send up that follow-up email um, that actually has a recording of today. That way you can go back and watch it, you can share it, you can ask more questions, and you'll have our contact information through that email. Um, again, please go ahead and register for that symposium if that's something you're interested in. We'd absolutely love to have you um, finally meet in person, um, which we're very excited about. And um, we have great caterers, we have great topics, great speakers. So it's going to be a really wonderful time, um, something local here that you're not going to find anywhere else. So please go ahead and join us for that. Um, I don't see any more questions. So we're going to go ahead and okay. say thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Jenny, for sharing your expertise today. Always a pleasure. And then with that, everyone have a great rest of your Wednesday. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everyone.